Well, why don't we go ahead and, ahead and get started? Um, so welcome everybody. I'm Dan Stanzione. I'm the director at TAC, uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center, and the PI for the, the New Frontera Award. Um, I'm actually coming to you live from the National Science Foundation building where we're having meetings about the machine <laughs> today. So I'm in a Ed Walker's office here. So if uh, the network drops out, we can blame the feds um, for that. So, um, so thanks all of you for taking some time. Um, just sc scanning through the names here. I know some of you have been to some presentations uh, about the machine. Um, so I've done a bunch in person over the last few months since we've gotten the award. Um, uh, for you, there is some new things that you haven't seen before uh, as we get closer to, to launching operations on the machine. Um, so, um, but we, we haven't done anything on the web yet to really uh, tell people what's coming in the system. So uh, we thought we'd take the opportunity today to just let you know um, a little bit about the system, a little bit about why we made the choices we made, and then important things like how you might uh, get on or apply for an allocation, um, who can get on, uh, and what the time frame of things are uh, at this point. So um, without further ado, um, I assume, can everyone see the slides? Anybody out there not muted? So do appreciate it if you're not speaking, if you could stay muted because we have 120 something people and one of you's in an airport, I'm sure. So, so. all right, so let's move ahead. So, um, and we now have a chat window live. So, okay, so, uh, so you know that the proposal was called the, the uh, Title slide there said Computing for the Endless Frontier, which was actually the name of the proposal. Um, many of you may know that the next system going in at Oak Ridge will also be called Frontier, and they got it into the federal budget prior to us getting awarded, so our machine is now called Frontera. Um, so origin of the name, we've now covered that. Um, so the Frontera system and project is uh, sponsored by the National Science Foundation, um, and it's really sort of a three-phase project. Um, currently, it's a three-cooperative agreement project to maximize the number of reports that we write about it. Um, but the first one is to deploy the system that I'm about to describe. And so this is the system that we will do. Um, we're actually in process now, but will be this year for the largest challenges now. It is the um, spiritual successor to Blue Waters. Um, so... Uh, we will then uh, support and operate this system through about 2024. Uh, and then there's a phase to plan a follow-on system to Frontera, where, where the user base of Frontera will be sort of the, the, the test cases for what this next system would look like. But the idea is to do a system at 10x that capability, um, which we're just calling phase two at the moment, uh, in 2024 that will follow this one along. So we'll talk a little bit about sort of activities around planning for that as well. Um, and that system would run through 2029. So we're really thinking about a roadmap for sort of the next decade of the NSF supported piece of computational science. Um, so I can get the slides to advance. Ah, oh, yes, the proof of life slide. So um, we are in the midst of deployment. Uh, we're in the fairly early phases of the actual hardware deployment at the moment, but uh, I thought it'd be worthwhile. Uh, for just to say that there is a system that exists. So you can see the storage racks there in the center. Uh, it's Jun Sung Hyo installing storage racks. You can see uh, those are the water cooled units for the Mellanox switches on the left, uh, the management rack on the right. So um, the core switches, a lot of the storage, um, some of the nodes are in place. Most of the nodes are still coming, but the machine actually does exist. Um, so it is, it is really coming soon. So just a bit about the team. I just want to credit everybody quickly who uh, is playing a role in this. We actually have a very big team, um, obviously anchored at TAC in terms of operations at UT Austin um, with other partners around UT, including in particular the Institute for Computational Engineering and Science, which has now been rebranded the Odin Institute, so for Tinsley Odin. Um, but uh, Ohio State and the Mvapich team under DK Panda is helping us out with network support. Uh, our longtime partners at Cornell will continue to do our online training piece. Uh, Texas A&M is helping out with the campus bridging piece. 
Uh, and then we have another large set of partners involved in sort of planning for phase two and what the technologies and science challenges for that may look like, including Caltech and Chicago and Cornell and Davis, Georgia Tech, Princeton, Stanford, Utah. Um, and we have many, many vendors involved. Um, and now that NVIDIA has bought Mellanox, they're on the front of that list and we have some GPUs as well. So, um, so a really big team uh, involved in this. Um, let's just get right into the machine. Um, so I do want to save a fair amount of time for questions here, but uh, um, our primary compute system uh, will actually have two different compute systems, and I'll do a sort of standard block diagram in just a moment, but uh, is being delivered by Dell and Intel. Um, we're estimating, uh, and now we're past estimating because the chips exist, but we're at around uh, a peak performance for theoretical peak for whatever that's worth at this point of around 39 petaflops. Um, I'd estimate we'll have a Linpack number um, in the, the upper 20s <laughs> in terms of petaflops there. We're not far enough along to be able to start running that yet. We're using Mellanox, now NVIDIA, HDR links um, between the systems and a fat tree with the 200 gig cables between switches. We're still at 100 gig to the compute nodes. Um, as long as we're on Gen 3 PCI, that's about all you can move over the PCI bus anyway. Um, so we didn't upgrade at the node size. Uh, we'll have um, various kinds of storage, more than 50 petabytes in aggregate, um, and about one and a half terabytes a second of aggregate bandwidth mixed between flash and disk. More on that in a moment. Um, we will have a specialized subsystem around single precision with NVIDIA. I'll make some new announcements about that uh, today um, during the webinar here. And then a whole bunch of front end nodes, more than we have traditionally done to deal with data movers, automated workflows, APIs, and other persistent services. Um, that we see across the system and we'll need going forward. So um, first a bit about the processor decision that we've made. So um, let's see, uh, the official announcement of the next generation of the Intel Xeon scalable processor, um, which is the, the hard way to say Cascade Lake, um, which I'm not supposed to say either before or after the announcement, um, happens April 4th, so I can't not supposed to say too terribly much about those processors yet, but uh, um, I'm probably including that it happens April 4th, but the, uh, um, what we have picked the very top bin, essentially, of the next generation of Xeon to be the core processor. Um, so in essence, after our many experiments with many core of various kinds, um, which we've learned a lot from, and many of those things are integrated into the new processors, but, um, and with GPUs and with other exotic architectures, we've decided that vanilla is the best strategy here in a lot of ways. So, um, you know, I have used this slide a few times where I say this might be the most boring machine config you've ever seen, but for many of our users, boring translates to useful. Um, so we, we have sort of abandoned the quest of more cores and lower clock rate for power efficiency instead of in favor of more power and higher clock rate um, because our sort of basic analysis is that though in terms of peak flops, you are less efficient at the high clock rates. In terms of real delivered flops to users, you may not be. Um, the, your ability to deliver flops out of those chips is higher. So we're going away from the sort of gold bin parts that we've traditionally used in Xeons for HPC, at, you know, the 130 to 145 watts per socket to the ones that are over 200 watts per socket, um, which means we're gonna have a much higher clock rate than those of you who have been Stampede use 2 users um, are seeing. We'll have a few more cores. I think at this point I can say we're using the 28 core SKU, so there's 56 cores per node um, uh, at about a 30% higher clock rate than the Stampede 2 ones. Um, so uh, it also means that we don't have air cooling on these chips. So testing is sort of interesting. We have to hit you know, a certain number of hundreds of gallons per minute of water flow before we can actually turn them on. Um, but we will be doing direct water cooling, liquid cooling to uh, all of the chips in the system because at 205 watts per socket, two of those and a half U nodes, so 410 watts, we're at 65,000 watts per rack, so we've, we've reached the end of air cooling. So, uh, but from a user perspective, um, the power costs more, but you don't care. So, um, so versus Stampede 2, for those of you who've used our system there, it's, we're pushing up the clock rate, the core count, the main memory speed will go up some. Um, our analysis is just that this is as close to the free performance as we can give you. Everything's POSIX, no code changes. Um, 
for what you need to do, except of course, for the fact that we're now at 56 cores per node. Um, so a few words about the GPU portion of the subsystem. So we wrote this in the proposal strictly around doing single precision computation um, based on changes with NVIDIA in terms of uh, licensing and sort of general looking at the workload since we've made uh, a few tweaks to this, but we're still having a GPU system that's really targeted at mostly AI users and molecular dynamics users, although it will be open to everyone who wants to use it. Um, but we've divided this into two components. Um, and because this got added on later, it took a while to negotiate, but it is now in place. So I'm pleased to be able to finally say um, that we will have uh, one queue that is um, sort of largely separate from the rest of the system in many ways, because it will be architecturally very different. And there are nodes that will look much like the DOE's Sierra system, or some but with a couple of lost GPUs, um, but we'll have uh, IBM Power9 CPUs so that we can have direct NVLink connections to the GPUs and then four V100s in each node. Um, InfiniBand interconnects, we'll have some, you'll see your regular Frontera file systems there, but we'll have a local scratch for, for high performance uh, just for the GPU side of things. Um, but so those are the sort of full feature GPUs. And then for the true single precision stuff, we'll also have 114 um, not in V-linked uh, uh, nodes, four GPUs per node, so 456 with the 2080 Ti NVIDIA GPUs um, on an Intel processor. Uh, so we'll have an additional about 900 GPUs across the system. Um, again, our, our analysis is that the, the MD codes do great, things like TensorFlow do great. Um, so we'll sort of prioritize those on the nodes, but there will be um, certainly options for others, and of course for these you'll need to use CUDA or some other um, perhaps open MP5 or another way of approaching the programming model for GPUs. So that is not a no code changes thing, um, but the capability will be there as well. Um, for the file system, um, most all of you on here have used a big system before. Um, all of you therefore have gotten an email that says the system is down. That email probably said something about the file system. Um, so the, the weakest part of any of these large systems uh, are uh, typically the file system uh, because it's the one place where we can't really do great performance isolation between users, right? If one user is doing something that opens and closes a whole bunch of small files and somebody else is driving bandwidth at the same time, you're going to impact each other <laughs> in certain ways, right? With compute nodes, we just put one user on a node and memory performance, processor performance are completely isolated. The file system is shared and across the network um, and people push it in different ways. Um, so historically in HPC, we've built sort of one massive scratch file system because we were trying to drive bandwidth up. And to drive bandwidth up, we had to buy enough disk spindles to get that bandwidth. Uh, so capacity almost came for free to get the bandwidth target that you wanted to get. Um, in the new age of solid state storage, um, bandwidth and capacity sort of scale independently. Um, so it finally occurred to us, why are we building one giant scratch file system that we know single users have the ability to kill and it becomes the weak link in reliability um, when we can build any bandwidth and any uh, capacity we want. So we will divide scratch into several file systems. Um, there will be uh, sort of three normal scratch pools that you as users will be round robined between. Um, so uh, you'll only be competing with one third of the users. Um, for normal scratch at any given time. And then we'll have a fourth file system built entirely out of flash. Um, and the ultimate plan for that is for it to also be a completely POSIX file system, no code changes, no automatic migration, no burst buffer. It will just be an all flash luster file system um, to which you will write your data like you would any other file system. But to get access to that, you need to show us that you need either the bandwidth or the IOPS. So we'll be looking for jobs that create file system problems. Um, and then migrating them into this flash file system. So, but again, it will be zero code changes um, to use it. And we will just restrict to people opening and closing tens of thousands of very small files or um, needing very high bandwidth will get uh, sort of restricted access to the high speed file system. And everybody else will have a happy, hopefully much quieter and much more reliable scratch file system to live on um, with our usual policies around that. So, that leaves us with sort of this picture. Um, so we'll have uh, now several kinds of, in the compute subsystem, our primary sort of 38 plus petaflops, 
Uh, the configuration I can say is a little over 8,000 nodes. You should just think of it as 8,000. There's some change for various pieces put in, 8,050 something actual nodes of Xeon compute, uh, the 900 plus GPUs in the single precision system, um, the fast scratch and the normal scratch in the storage subsystems. Uh, and then as I mentioned, we'll have login, data mover and API nodes on the front end, all sharing the InfiniBand fabric um, and then routing to the outside world for archive systems, commercial clouds, et cetera. More on that in a moment. Um, but that's basically the overview of the hardware that we're buying. Um, as I mentioned, there's a little infrastructure that has to go behind this. This will be six megawatts given the processors that we're using. So um, enough to run six small towns, shall we say. Um, in terms of power, we'll be pumping 100,000 plus gallons an hour of water to cool this thing. Um, direct water cooling for the compute racks. The, the 2080 GPUs were actually doing oil immersion cooling. Um, as I said, this is not the most power efficient CPU choice in terms of theoretical flops. We actually do think it's the most power effect, efficient choice in terms of delivered flops. But regardless, we're going to do um, a few things in the infrastructure to improve power efficiency. One is the direct water cooling and the, the oil immersion cooling. Um, but we'll also be getting about a third of the power for the system from wind credits um, from the West Texas wind farms. And we have a couple of hundred kilowatts of solar that's going in directly um, to offset at least some of the power cost um, associated with the system. But it is a behemoth from uh, an infrastructure perspective as well. Uh, so a little bit about the support activities. Um, we'll do everything you sort of normally expect <laughs> out of a a supercomputer center in terms of supporting these. Uh, I admit I mostly keep this slide here um, to point out to, I think some of our program officers might be on the call, but that all these things still cost money to do in terms of operation, but um, we'll have expert scientific support you can request, extended collaborative support. Many of you are familiar with that through Exceed. Um, online documentation, online and in-person training, ticket support, staff 24 by seven to answer. We'll have several thousand RPMs that make up the software stack for it. Um, we have upgraded the archive around this. We'll put in about a half a petabyte, half an exabyte rather of initial capacity, but we'll have the libraries to scale to an exabyte at this point. The shared work file system across all the different tax systems, um, the mix of queues, priority tuning and reservations for emergent needs, real time storm forecasting, et cetera, um, that many people request, reservations for classes, things like that. Um, will all be supported. Um, those are all sort of vanilla things. Um, other things that you've probably seen on some of our other systems, we will do auto tuning of the MPI stack. So it will uh, periodically be recompiled to discover um, uh, links that are up versus links that are down and understand the topology and so be a little better than a vanilla MPI and tuned to the specific topology that we have in the system. Um, and retuned is, you know, cables don't perform or something like that while we're fixing them. Uh, so we do some automated performance monitoring on every job. Some of you have seen this through our tech stats collection and exalt collections um, that we use to find, for instance, which job is generating a bunch of metadata traffic and needs to go to the flash file system. Um, but largely to, to help identify problems and proactively do consulting. Um, we also build a big database of these jobs that we've shared with a number of research teams in terms of how they operate. Uh, because we'll have a little bit smaller community than we have with Stampede. Um, you know, we're estimating to start with 50 to 100 projects on this machine this year. We're going to do direct support on Slack. Um, so you'll have be able to just jump onto a Slack channel and ask questions. Every allocated user will have a Slack account. Um, we can get away with this versus our Exceed systems because we'll have several thousand less users. Um, 10,000 on Slack doesn't work very well. A couple of hundred works pretty well. So. Uh, so we'll do direct user support from Slack. But all those are sort of more or less traditional HPC support activities. Um, we'll also have some of the new activities. Uh, one is support for containers. We've already rolled this out on Stampede and Takari at TAC, but uh, we'll support Singularity. We may support a few other container standards going forward. We're still evaluating that, but Singularity, definitely true um, now and in the future. So this gives us the ability to support a whole lot more applications, um, perhaps with less system specific tuning than we will. We'll probably still have several hundred apps that we have built specifically for the system that are the core apps there. But I believe through our various repositories we can talk to in Singularity, we have 
um, containers that will work that support an additional, last time I checked it was 14,137 applications that you can check out a container for. So, I um, mean, we just, no way we could build all of those natively and support them in-house. So, uh, so if you want to develop in Docker and upload to a repository, we can download and run that as a singularity container on the system. Um, this will still not be a default, but if you have controlled unclassified information, ITAR, protected data, FISMA, um, you still need to contact us and work with us around compliance plans for this, but uh, we will support that on the system. We just see more and more of that in the ecosystem. Um, I still firmly believe that in the next five years, there'll be some privacy and data protection standard around every federal grants data. So, um, so just to get ready for that, we're going to support it now um, on all the systems. Uh, the most recent one I've seen is that the username, uh, Username password pairs count as GDPR protected data in Europe. So your actual user database has to be treated as personally identifiable information. So, um, so it's coming. <laughs> We're just going to be ready for it. So if you're dealing in the spaces where we might have kept you off systems in the past with patient data, um, student data, those kinds of things, um, that is welcome on these systems. And we'll have these application servers on the front end. Of course, we'll support data transfer services like Globus. We'll support the REST APIs we've built out at TAC that we've supported on recent systems, but if you want to build any sort of service you want on top of those, those will be persistent services. Um, we're committing to support the Open Science Grid stack um, for some of the LHC services and LIGO services. Um, we're talking to the Pegasus team about supporting their workflow engine, um, but other services is needed. So if your science requires you to have a persistent service to ingest data, to distribute workload, whatever it happens to be. We'll have some nodes where we can run those as a persistent service rather than just something scheduled in periodically on compute jobs. Uh, so of course, because we've seen a ton of this um, in recent years uh, uh, that through the Science Gateways Institute has sort of led the way on this, led by San Diego, which we um, closely collaborate with, we will build some default portals and gateways for the system. Um, these won't be available the day the system goes live because the way these projects work is we don't get staffing money until the system is actually acquired and deployed. So uh, we'll be customizing portals that we have, but that development won't, won't, won't start until uh, operation starts. But sometime over the next year or so, um, you'll start to see these things appear for dealing with geospatial data, for being able to do sort of a low code machine learning environment where you want to run a TensorFlow app on a data set on the machine without having to install and configure all that to do Jupyter notebooks um, and those sorts of things. And of course, we'll have all the API pieces there that if you wanna get your particular gateway or your community's particular gateway to target Frontera as a backend, that'll be a supported activity. So I also mentioned we're you know, using the system to help design what we hope will be the next generation of NSF systems in 2024. Um, so we'll be deploying a number of prototype systems as well uh, and our plan for sort of these phase two prototypes is to put some test beds in and of course we'll use them internally for a while, but then actually just to open them up to users. Um, so that, uh, you know, if we put out say an FPGA test bed and none of our science users actually use it, um, that's probably a pr pretty good indicator that we shouldn't scale that up in a big system. Um, if we put out something like a tensor processor and all of our users want to flock to it and use it, that's also a pretty good indication that we maybe make that a significant component of the next system. Um, so some will be processors, some will be more network. Um, we will have an FPGA testbed fairly shortly. We're rolling out an Octane in VDIM testbed as part of the system. Uh, this says 50 nodes. We've actually decided to go a little less than 50 nodes, but to put more DIMs of these non-volatile DIMs into each system. Um, that you know, maybe you'd want to use as a checkpoint file system, maybe you'd want to use as a large memory node. They sort of can be very fast storage or very slow memory, depending on your perspective on them. Um, but where we'd have several terabytes per node populated across the different DIM channels um, of non-volatile DIM. So that'll be one test system everyone will have access to. Um, we're putting in a quantum simulator at Stanford, with our partners at Stanford, um, which we'll have access to. Uh, and some will be through the commercial cloud. Um, more on that in a moment. But we do want whatever we do in phase two, five years from now, to be at least um, in part a result of what our actual users have run on actual hardware um, and what you want to run on. So um, there's plenty of other parts of phase two planning um, that happen as well, but 
uh, all of you who become users should look out to get onto these testbed systems that will open up um, and see if you like them, hate them, and you know we'll be automatically collecting some feedback, but hopefully you can share some feedback with us as well. So, um, so that's sort of phase two stuff. Uh, I should also say we're going to try and leverage some other things around the ecosystem, both within TAC and at other places around the country, um, wherever possible. Uh, obviously, there's things like Globus um, for data transfer software, but through APIs, we'd like to support through the data portal, Google Dataset Search, for instance. Um, we'll support, again, for application services through our VM farm, through our APIs, through mounting shared storage. You'll have access to our archive system. Um, we'll partner with the o Open Storage Network and Oklahoma's new uh, Bring Your Own Storage Network to give you other storage options, um, direct upload to put various public data repositories, um, and then finally, we're going to work with the public cloud providers for data publication as well. So um, let me just dive in on that. I've alluded to it a few times now. So uh, it is our firm belief that uh, cloud and HPC is not an either or binary decision. Um, in some ways, we think of our HPC system as a specialized cloud, right? For all of you, it's remote and you don't get the whole thing. You get a part of it. So that is cloud in many ways. But when we think about the commercial cloud in particular, um, we feel like it has some outstanding capabilities that are very different than the capabilities we provide. So we're partnering with Amazon, with Google, and with Microsoft um, to bring uh, into your workflow, we hope, the things where cloud does well, um, but not really the notion that you're gonna replace your computation on Frontera with uh, work in the cloud. But you may wanna publish, publish your data sets through the cloud and make that the permanent home for uh, where you keep analytics about who downloads your data and how it gets reused um, in the future through the cloud. That we think is sort of a cloud strength. So again, you can move data to our archive or we will move it to the commercial cloud for you and set it up there, you know, publish it with a DOI perhaps. Um, we think there's sort of unique cloud services that make sense. Um, Microsoft in particular is interested in bringing virtual desktop interfaces so that you can make calls to the machine from a desktop metaphor. Um, but maybe you want to use the natural language processing service that Google already has or an image tagging service that they already have. There's no reason for us to necessarily um, replicate those as that's the front end of your workflow that then has a big you know, set of analysis on those images that you've tagged. Um, we will provide some cloud time to users to sort of integrate these together um, and work on federated identity, et cetera. Um, Another thing the cloud guys have that we don't is they deploy pretty much every technology pretty much every month um, at much greater scale than we can possibly keep up with. So, you know, every new GPU, they all have tensor processors, they all have quantum projects going, they're all looking at neuromorphic, all of these things are gonna come out. Uh, they're probably going to have them first. So for instance, if you wanna access a Google TPU um, to do some benchmarking on versus the work you do on Frontera, we can provide some cloud time to do that sort of thing too. Um, so we probably will look at the file system federation and some cloud bursting things, but in the end, I don't think that's where we're gonna find value in the cloud. It's gonna be in these other services that they provide. So, um, so we put a little money into this with all three cloud providers just to prove to them that we are serious about doing this. Um, so that means, you know, if you wanna publish a data set, we can not only migrate it there and set you up, we can pay for the first few months of it being there at some point, you know, if you're gonna keep your data forever in the cloud, um, we will start handing you the bill, but at least initially a lot of this work can come at the cost of the project you know, as part of your allocation uh, is the model there. So let's just talk a little bit. That's sort of the system and the operations um, as it exists. So, um, but this being a new user webinar, you're probably asking whether or not you can use it. So um, just run through the criteria quickly. Quickly, so you are eligible to apply for an allocation on Frontera um, for anyone doing unclassified research. You know, we do deal with protected data, but truly classified work, uh, this is still an open system. So that, that is out, right? And if you're doing DOD classified work or things like that, um, you do not have to necessarily be NSF funded. We do try and give a little bit of preference in the process to um, first NSF funded and then US government funded uh, work. Um, but there is a pool for private sector, for other R FFRDC users to get onto the machine. Um, and if you're writing an allocation proposal, you should be PI eligible, meaning uh, you 
have, have the ability to hold the grant <laughs> or contract at your institution uh, where you work. Uh, so that's to be, to get an allocation. You can be a user if you're at a US university company or an FFRDC and federally funded research and development center, by the way, and you're added to an allocation by a PI. Um, you can also be at a non-US institution if you have a collaboration with a US researcher who has an allocation um, and you're not in a country to which we are subject to export control restrictions. Um, so there's a few countries where we can't add users if they are working in that country. Um, if you're working in the US, you're fine. Um, but if you are, say, in uh, Japan and collaborating with someone at a US university and they have an allocation, they can put you on their allocation and non-US users are totally fine. Um, uh, and again, even if you're not a U.S. national, but you are legally working or studying in the U.S., you are absolutely eligible um, to be on the machine. So, uh, so just about everybody who's not living and working in an export-restricted country um, can access the machine. Um, so what is the process? So uh, there'll be sort of two different ways to get on. One is the, through the NSF, what has been called the PRAC, or Petascale Resource Allocation Process, that's been used for Blue Waters. Uh, at this time, the Dear Colleague letter um, has already gone out for the early user allocation period. So for sort of the bigger users, there's been a fantastic response to that. Um, we'll follow with a regular Pratt call for full production operations once those commence in a few months. We are trying to update that process a little bit from the old process. Um, that's not quite baked yet, but you know, you'll see announcements uh, and probably sometime late summer, early fall, there'll be a new call um, for proposals for time on the machine. Um, this PRAC pool will cover the bulk of the cycles, most of the big users um, to get on the machine to do very large things, but we'll have a few other tracks um, to get other people onto the machine to do other things. So we also have, and this is probably the thing that you could do in the short term, um, to get on while waiting for the next PRAC call, is we have a fairly large discretionary pool on this one for startup debt projects. If you just need a little bit of allocation, say to get data for a, a PRAC proposal or a larger allocation, you wanna run some scaling, um, for industry allocations, for work that maybe not is not quite yet at this sort of mini petaflop scale, but is on the way, we'll do some what we call pathways allocations for those. Um, and then we're going to have a special pool for sort of large communities. If you have a gateway um, and it's hard for you to articulate that, you know, you will have these three grad students doing these three sets of experiments because a bunch of users show up and run stuff and you know roughly how much they run, but you can't really describe each experiment. We'll have a, a way to allocate um, at least initially through discretionary time for gateways to use the machine as well, or any other large communities like the LHC community, the LIGO community, the Ice Cube community, the Neon community, um, wh whatever it is, we'll have these sort of community allocations as well. So you can either come as an individual PI through the PRAC route, um, or you can apply as either an individual or a community through these other um, routes as well to get folks on the system. Um, we want to make sure it's well utilized, so we're going to squeeze in everyone we can um, moving toward the system. So uh, if you're considering running, there's a few things you can do right this moment. Um, and uh, whether you're already a current PRAC user from Blue Waters and making the transition, or if you're new to the program, uh, so uh, we, we can't quite put new users on yet. It'll be a couple more months before we're th that far along. Um, but we have been sort of modeling the software environment for this, uh, the kernel may change one more time before we get live, but you know, the latest CentOS kernel, the latest container work, the OS, the compilers, everything we're gonna use. Um, Stamp 2 our current sort of flagship system, for those of you who don't know, uh, a big chunk of it is Knight's Landing, but there's also a part of it that's Intel Skylake. So that's the Xeon immediately preceding the Xeon that we're gonna use um, in Frontera. So if you get onto that Stamp 2 Skylake partition, um, you're gonna see almost exactly the software environment uh, that you'll see on Frontera. And we already have over 1,700 nodes, more than 80,000 cores available in that partition in Skylake. And hopefully tuning you do there, um, you'll just move to the new machine and everything will go somewhat faster because of the higher clock rate, bandwidth, et cetera. So, um, but it's architecturally roughly the same. Compiler optimizations, you know, the same version of the Intel compiler will be there, et cetera. So, um, if you are looking to get onto Frontera or you will get an allocation on Frontera, um, you are welcome to come and request a startup allocation on Stampede 2 today and start running there. Um, we will set aside some time if you request it um, before the Frontera go live for you to do some scaling tests. 
um, so we can support some fairly large runs um, on Stampede. Uh, sort of through the normal queue, there's usually so many jobs, it's hard to get some big runs, but if you need to do some, we can set aside sort of a large run day um, to do some of these things. A lot of our maintenance is really about squeezing in large experiments, um, but we'll give you enough time to get started and you know, get your data over to tech, get your um, codes running and scaling on Stampede 2, and then just swap you over to Frontera when the time comes. So uh, you can request that startup on Stampede 2 as soon as we finish talking here, um, and we can put you on within a few days uh, and get you up and running on that machine. So please do that. Uh, the other thing I'd like to put out a call for is if you need to move data, we're ready to start doing that. In fact, we have started doing that, um, particularly if you have data in the Blue Waters archive, um, which will be shut down over the next year or so, um, and you need to move, go ahead and file a ticket right now, even if you don't have an allocation yet, even if you haven't applied yet, but if you think you will, um, uh, we have the new archive system up and running, so uh, I did say we were using some transition space initially, but now we can just run you right into the archive and your data will be resident the day Frontera goes live. And so a number of teams I know are already moving data but we have uh, many petabytes to move, maybe 30 petabytes or so. So we're gonna need a fair number of months to move all of that. So please, please, if you have data to move, uh, don't hesitate, give us a call. In fact, if you're gonna need to stage a bunch of data from anywhere else, um, go ahead and call us now too. Because again, the archive is live. Um, the sort of work file system that we use to swing between systems is live. So we can go ahead and put you somewhere um, so that your data is here uh, when your allocation goes live. So again, just uh, email us, put in a ticket through the TAC user portal, link on a slide or two, um, and, let, and start doing that right away. Uh, so if you do get an allocation, um, if you have any kind of an account at TAC now, that ID and password will work. So if you have a TAC account, that ID and password is fine. You don't need to get a new account. If you have an Exceed account already, you also don't need to get a new account um, we'll have to activate it on TAC if you haven't used another TAC system, but you can use your exceed ID and password to get on the system. We're not gonna create sort of a new third space um, for doing accounts, but if you have neither of those and you think you'd like to get on, just go to the portal, the link is there, um, portal.tac.utexas.edu, um, and you can instantly create your own web account through the portal um, and use that to request your SAMP2 startup um, or request one of the discretionary allocations for Frontera as well. Um, once you have both an account and an allocation, um, you'll be able to get through the Frontera ticket queue, you'll be able to get onto the Slack, the Slack team is also already live. Um, so you can immediately start asking us questions. And again, remember if you're moving data, don't wait for an allocation, go ahead and get started. We can do it now. We're gonna need to move data every single day. So, so please do that. So. Um, so I think that's the story about how to apply for allocations. Uh, so timeline for access. So as I showed at the beginning on the very, one of the very first slides, uh, we, we are in the midst where hardware is sort of here and more is still to come, um, but a lot of stuff we haven't been able to turn on yet. So um, we don't have it all. So this is what we call the unknown unknowns phase of deployment. So um, ideally we would have wanted to have everything in by now, but you know, in, in a shock to no one who's ever done one of these, deliveries are running a bit behind schedule, um, but we're still more or less on track. If nothing else goes wrong, I foolishly say out loud because something else always goes wrong. So, um, but if nothing surprising happens, uh, we still anticipate that we'll start external user access late May, early June, somewhere in that time frame. Uh, this will probably not be a throw the door open and everybody can run every day starting from day one. Um, for this early user, uh, there's gonna need to be some scale-up tests and some various large experiments that people have asked for. So uh, we'll probably phase people in a few projects at a time over those first few weeks, um, putting users on. There'll probably be a few reserve periods for some of these full system runs um, and full system experiments that people wanna do. But sometime before July, we anticipate that all the early users should be on and then full production will follow uh, uh, two or three months after that. So late summer, uh, early fall, we should move from the sort of early operations, early user phase into the full production phase for the system. But uh, at this point, um, we're probably just about two months away. But you know, again, the caution is as things get fired up, we could discover new systemic problems, things could happen that, that delay things. But uh, uh, 
other than deliveries are a few weeks behind where we'd prefer to be, um, we're, we're, we're still more or less on track and no real surprises yet. The processors exist and seem to work. You know, things like that are already in good shape, but until uh, we put it all together, there'll be things that we just don't know about. So the schedule can move. I always hate to talk about these timelines at this phase of the game because we just don't know quite enough yet, but, um, but very soon the system should exist. <laughs> so, um, we're excited about adding Frontera to the ecosystem of systems that we have, including the test beds and the GPUs as part of it. Um, so uh, let me thank the National Science Foundation primarily as the funding source for this and all the support we get from our donors, partners, our university, and our very many partners, and especially you, the users, because without you to come run science on these machines, there'd be no point in doing this. And that lets us have a lot of fun um, building and running them for you. So. Um, so with those thank yous, uh, so let me just, I forgot I put the slide in, but just finish with this quote here uh, that uh, this is from Humphrey Davy, and although I stole the slide from David Keyes, um, some of you may know, but, uh, but Humphrey Davy invented electrochemistry and used that to fill out a couple more rows on the periodic table in the 1800s. Um, and in this quote, he points out that the reason he was able to do so much more than the people who came before him is electrochemistry gave him this new tool. And with new tools, you can do new and exciting things um, that the people before you couldn't do. So um, I think he really meant to talk about our machine, even though he said this in 1812. Um, but uh, hopefully we're giving you a new tool to do some new exciting things uh, in the very near future. So with that, um, let me stop talking. I used 45 minutes of the hour, but we can stop and take any questions you might have about the system or operations or timelines or anything else. So um, the easiest way to, rather than having 125 people unmute and yell, um, chat might be the easiest way to do this. So if you just start typing questions in chat, we can respond as needed to the 124 of you that are left. Where is the Slack channel? Um, so and then transition. So we'll just run one at a time. So the Slack channel, uh, there'll be a special Slack team for Frontera. It's for allocated users at this point. I don't know the link off the top of my head. Maybe somebody can put that in chat, but uh, you'll get an email when your allocation goes active about how to get to it. Um, so second question there, how long will Stampede 2 continue? Um, right now, Stampede 2 is set to run, uh, and do we expect users to transition? And the answer is actually no. Um, so we will run Stampede 2 for a long time yet. Uh, I believe it is slated to shut down in August or September of 2022 at this point. So it's still got three years plus um, of useful life in it. Um, we've sort of extended operations of these from four to five years as the sort of difference in chips has slowed down. So, um, so we have three good years left in Stampede 2. Um, these are funded through separate NSF programs really targeting uh, separate workloads. Uh, Frontera is sort of targeted um, primarily at capability users, although we do a lot of that on Stampede 2 as well. But, um, well, long story short, since I see there are many more questions, uh, the idea is the very largest consumers of cycles we hope to transition to Frontera, um, and Stampede 2 would still serve the broader community. So um, the, the notion is we would limit to 50 or 100 projects at a time on Frontera, whereas Stampede 2, we typically have more like 1,500 active projects at any given time. Um, so if you have needs to run thousands of nodes simultaneously, um, we'd probably look to transition you to Frontera. If you just still need a lot of time, we'll continue to uh, um, keep Stampede 2 and hopefully a successor to that running through the Exceed ecosystem. So three years left on Stampede 2. Uh, let's see, third question. Um, so, uh, Slack channel info, current tech user, yes. So the Slack channel Frontera team, somebody can post that um, either to the chat or we'll send an email. Uh, so Jason or somebody, if you're out there, see if you can find the Slack link and put it up there. Uh, allocation process for the GPUs, same as the CPU nodes. Yes. Uh, um, yes. So we're going to give you an allocation in node hours, in essence, and we'll just have charge rates between the queue. Um, as you might imagine, a four GPU node, particularly the ones with the V100s and the Power 9s, have a pretty substantial cost difference between the regular compute nodes. So we'll just charge them at sort of the ratio of dollars of one to dollars of the other. Um, my guess is a four GPU node will charge at about a rate of five. 
Um, so you just burn five of your node hours to get an hour of GPU time. But anybody who has an allocation can submit to any of the queues. Um, so yes, they will be the same. So uh, yes, how much will be charged for GPUs? So similar question. Yeah, four GPUs per node, both in the uh, V100's case. Um, initially, we'll just do home mode allocations. It'll also be four GPUs per node in the 2080 Ti case without the NVLink. Um, in that, probably there first and eventually in others, we will look at doing sub-node allocations where you can virtualize a single GPU with a container. Um, so uh, the, uh, uh, but for now, yeah, you'll get four GPUs per node. You'll pay a charge rate of about uh, probably five, five and a half on the V100 nodes, probably closer to two on the 2080 nodes. Um, so let's see. Uh, uh, late May versus early June, how will early users be chosen? Early, early users be chosen. So, um, yeah, so again, NSF has selected, I believe, and they are not officially funded yet, but um, my understanding is order 30 or 35 projects for early user. We'll add a few more through discretionary. Um, in essence, uh, uh, the, the staging will mostly be able to pick a few projects and put them on there and see if we have any problems. <laughs> and if we don't, we will very rapidly scale it up. Um, and if we do, we will slow down as we address any problems that might occur. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully it'll only be a difference of a week or two. So the, the, the at least the initial answer is somewhat random um, for the first few. Uh, after that, the answer will be, Almost always, when we're scaling out some new technology, there will be some codes that work out of the box and some that expose weird bugs. So uh, we would slow down on the ones that have weird bugs and accelerate all the ones that we think are working cleanly on. So um, it's mainly just a capacity thing, not a science decision at that point. Uh, uh, let's see, Steve, how fast will Scratch performance compare to the current Scratch? Okay, so if you're a Stampede 2 user, um, I believe our scratch bandwidth there is, um, so between 150 and 200 gigabytes per second, but also very widely shared, right? The sort of average number of active jobs on Stampede 2 is about 400 um, that are sharing scratch. So uh, the single fastest scratch pool is the flash where we expect one to 1.2 terabytes a second um, to that flash pool. So the factor of six or seven, um, just sort of in raw bandwidth plus a lot less concern concurrency. So I would think, you know, 5X as comfortable, 10X as possible. Um, so uh, uh, let's see. So um, when exactly would Frontera be available for users to use the allocation, May or June, the allocation will run for one whole year or has to be used by the end of 2019. Okay, so uh, that's sort of a multi-part question here. So uh, May or June, basically depends on how deployment goes from this stage, right? So I, I can't really answer that question no later than June is our theory, but we're hoping if things go well, we can back that up into May. Uh, if you're talking about, if you have an allocation through the, the Dear Colleague letter that went out or you're about to get one and you've been notified that it may be coming, uh, it's to be used by the end of 2019, I believe. Uh, we typically look at carryover on some of these things. So, um, we, we haven't allocated every possible cycle through that process, so um, there should be plenty of time to get done by the 2019. Uh, the, the model for regular allocations is to actually look at either one or two years um, in duration. So once you get to regular allocations in full production, um, you can ask for 12 or 24 months um, from whatever date your allocation starts. Uh, what batch system will be used? That's an easy one. Uh, so, um, the, uh, it's Slurm. So, sorry, I'm looking at some other messages. So, uh, yeah, it will be Slurm. It'll look just like the Stampede 2 Slurm queues. I mean, probably different queue names, but largely, uh, um, largely the same sort of configuration, priority, tuning, fair share, all that kind of stuff, but Slurm. So, heck, I answered all the current questions before the time ran out. Um, already surprising. So are there other questions out there? And thanks everybody for asking. We've had what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, a whole bunch of questions coming in. So, yes, I wish I could give you an exact start day, but we, we do it as soon as we can. 
<laughs> so that's the short answer. And if I, if I had picked a safe start day, I'd have to build in a bunch of margin that I'd rather give you back if we, if we get lucky. So, yep. Here's a few more. So, uh, job size QBs. Ah, yes. What will the large job size be? Um, so we actually usually relax that a little bit as the machine goes into production. Um, uh, for large jobs, I, you know, we, we really want to focus more on large jobs. Uh, admittedly, Tommy and I haven't had a detailed discussion about that yet for this, but uh, um, I would think on day one, we might go up to a quarter of the system for large jobs. So a couple thousand nodes, so hundred thousand cores um, uh, with a special request queue for larger runs. Um, we do want to do as, uh, um, as much as we can uh, in terms of size, but we'll probably start, you know, without sysadmin intervention at maybe a quarter of the system and then and maybe scale that up a little bit more um, once we get comfortably into production. Um, versus Stampede, we will bias this a little more towards the large jobs versus than, than capacity. Uh, so a quarter, but there'll be a request queue to go up to the full system. Uh, let's see. Uh, how much memory on the two GPU nodes? Yes, it's possible I didn't mention that, which is why you didn't recall it. Uh, so let me see if I can recall off the top of my head. The, the, the IBM nodes will be high RAM, uh, 512 gig um, uh, per node of DRAM, and then you know, four by 16 gig on the, the, the GDDR memory on those for the V100s. The, uh, the desktop class GPUs, the, the 2080 Ti's, uh, those are on Intel, so I believe we set them up at 128 gig. So yeah, so if you're using the 2080s, sort of as throughput nodes, you'll have 128. If you're using the V100s, it's 512. Mm -hmm. uh, the main compute nodes, I may not have mentioned this either. It's you know, it's the standard thing for the current generation of Xeons. Yeah. You have to populate. It's multiples of 12 because you populate 12 DIMMs. So uh, and 16 is the the sweet spot in pricing. So it's 192 gig on the regular compute nodes. So. Uh, let's see. Uh, IBM's JS run on the IBM nodes. Um, I believe we are. Uh, there is. Uh, I'm not sure how deeply that's integrated with their LSF stuff at the moment. So um, the IBM guys will be out next week, I believe, to start working on software config on that stuff. So. Um, yeah, we, we intend to run that on Slurm as well and not on LSF. So if we can make JS run work independent of LSF, we will support it. <laughs> ah, can a single job use the IBM and Intel nodes concurrently? Um, our current intention is no. Um, and the reason for that is the fabrics aren't going to be super well integrated. There are ties between them, um, but they're basically separate fat trees between the IBM core switch and the uh, the Intel nodes core switch. Um, we will have more bandwidth actually to the 2080 nodes. So you could span those two, um, but we'll have enough bandwidth to make file copy easy and things like that between the fabrics, but MPI traffic between them uh, would probably be a special case. So um, I think that's probably not a policy we would allow by default, but if you have a use case where we could maybe set up a special experiment for you, you should reach out to us and we can see what we do. But I think the default policies, those will just be separate queues you submit to. Um, uh, given that the ones in Power9 and your binaries aren't gonna cross, we'll probably actually just have you log in from Frontera to an IBM login node to do that. But yes, if you have a use case for mixed nodes, we would love to talk to you about it. So. <laughs> But I will just warn you, we won't have full bisection bandwidth between the two kinds of nodes. Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, so that was what uh, both Giannis and Andre asked about the mixed nodes thing. So yes, please, you know, send me an email personally. I think, did I not put my email on the last slide? I'm a bad person. So I'm Dan at tech.utexasstudy.eu for things that are out of the ordinary, file a ticket, email me. Um, Soon there'll be Slack if you have an allocation. So uh, and we can chat that way, but we're, uh, yeah, we're always happy to look at sort of innovative cases. So yes, and if you're not bandwidth limited, as you imply, then we might be able to do some things, so. All right, any last questions? We're approaching the top of the hour here.
So we're down to 103. I think by my count, we peaked around 139. So on here. So I really do appreciate everyone taking the time. Um, we're really excited to have all of you on the system. So, um, and don't hesitate to reach out with questions. Um, and we'll, we'll get it to you as fast as we can. Now I'm watching the participant count trickle down, so. All right, so not seeing any more questions. Um, thanks very much to everybody and we will uh, sign off now. So appreciate your time. Looking forward to working with all of you.